Right, so I think this is approximately where we left off. Here's a comparison of our k-means results with complete linkage results. <clears throat> no, this is an error in the slide. This is actually the single linkage results that you can easily recognize. And, and as we said, you know, some aspects of the data after the classification into these regions are actually quite well represented. Um, many of the data points that sort of look bimodal here <coughs> fall into the same cluster. But there's a, there's a bit of a problem um, that, that Raphael pointed out in his, in his last slide. If you look at this cluster here, there seem to be very disparate data points. Um, you know, this bimodal distribution and round flat distributions um, that uh, seem to all fall into the same cluster. You know, why aren't the flat ones over there but they're over here? And the, the problem here is that um, since k-means uses Euclidean distances to update its centroids and to calculate the distance from the centroids to the data points, uh, the whole thing kind of depends on uh, how uh, the variance in your data points is, is represented. So you can imagine if the variance in one dimension is very large and very small in another dimension, the only information available for clustering it really is in that one dimension with the large variance. And to treat all your dimensions equally, or at least not to inadvertently downvalue their importance, you should really be rescaling this to the variance or standardizing your data before you do k-means clustering. And once you do that, the clusters turn out uh, rather differently. So all the data are now standardized on the variances in the different dimensions. And the clusters uh, actually look a lot more similar, um, not, not as, as homogenous anymore. For instance, in this cluster here, you really get clustering together very nicely of the spinal distribution, and you really distinguish it well from the unimodal peak here. So standardizing the data before you do the clustering <coughs> allows you to make sure that all dimensions contribute equally to uh, your clustering problem. So kind of, of converting the expression levels to these scores kind of? Yeah, yeah. OK. So these are useful techniques, fast and easy to implement. Um, you have to beware a little bit of memory requirements for hierarchical clustering. Why? What is the memory requirement dependent on for hierarchical clustering? What's the fundamental comparison that you use for hierarchical clustering? Remember? Distance matrix? Right? So there's a memory requirement arising from the fact that you need a matrix of all pairwise distances, and it's a square matrix. So basically, for n data points, you need n square um, sized distance matrix contracts. It's a bit ad hoc in defining the number of clusters and uh, in defining exactly which distance metric to use, what constitutes a good clustering, and so on. And um, so it is very useful as an exploratory data analysis method. The results of cluster analysis are not necessarily the be all and end all of your analysis. Biological insight is still required. Now I'm going to go rather briefly through the more technical aspects of model based clustering basically as one example of more advanced, more insightful statistical methods that can be brought to the game. So model-based clustering is based on explicit probability models. So whereas in the other clustering methods, you don't actually go in with any notion about what your classes and clusters should look like, uh, model-based clustering is based on so-called normal mixture models. Um, Basically, a normal mixture model is simply different normal distributions associated with each class in your cluster and then all added together. So if I take two normal distributions and I plot them on the same uh, window, 
I have a normal mixture model because I've mixed these two normal distributions in one data set. So, <laughs> now if you have these normal mixture models, um, as you can clearly see, um, <laughs> you can apply sophisticated mathematics to <laughs> represent the probability that the, the clusters can actually be well represented in such a normal mixture model and then analyze what the properties of each contribution, each component in these normal mixtures would be. And mathematically, this com comes down to an eigenvalue decomposition where your components in the mixture is simply a sum over parameters that determine volume, orientation, and shape. And uh, don't borrow slides from people who do that. Do you people ever put animations on your PowerPoint slides? It's the bane of the audience. See, this is what happens then. <clears throat> it's, it's hard to turn off, too. You know, when you borrow a slide from somewhere, it's, it's got all these sound bells and whistles that detract from the information. Anyway, so the parameters can be set so that the normal mixtures should all have equal volume and be spherical. So basically, as you're adding different, larger numbers of parameters here, like with Occam's razor, you're basically getting a better fit at the end at the cost of including more parameters to describe what you're doing. And there's a trade-off here, because with enough parameters, you will get a perfect fit, but it may just be dependent on your parameters and not on the actual data. With too few parameters, your analysis will be too coarse, but, um, and again, will not represent the data well. And you can solve that in the mclustr package, and we'll go through an example of that. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that in this instance, you can actually compare the different models using the so-called Bayesian information criteria. And uh, and in the Bayesian paradigm of things, um, basically what this does, it gives you a probability um, that a given model is correct after accounting for the data that you've seen and the prior probability that the model would have been correct in the first place. So, Totally weird. Okay. The important aspect about this so called Bayesian information criteria is that two different values contribute. One here is calculated as the measure of fit. How well does your model actually fit, predict, and represent the data? And from that, you subtract a penalty term, which is essentially uh, the number of clusters that you need to represent your data in the first place. So the less clusters you need, the better. But the better each of the clusters fit, 
also the better. If your clusters aren't good, um, you're going to get poor measure of fit. But if you have too many clusters, but they're all perfect, you're also going to get a low information score. So this is where this trade-off between cluster size or cluster parameters and the number of clusters and the quality of fit is handled and calculated in a mathematically rigorous way with sound statistical theory behind it. And thus BIC can be used to choose the number of clusters and the covariance here. Um, so I'm go going to skip over this here. It basically works in, a, in pretty much the same way. Um, <clears throat> in, the, in the different degrees of freedom that you can apply to the normal mixtures here in, in the one that induces a spherical uh, normal mixtures here, you would get this kind of clustering here, which is, if you just visually compare it back to the k-means, uh, at least as good or at least as, as obvious as the k-means clustering means here, but it turns out that you can even get a better information score um, <clears throat> under a different parameter where you have a little more degrees of freedom because then everything falls apart into just three clusters within the day. And now, looking at this visually, I think you note that the three clusters now in each of, the, uh, of these genes fall together very, very nicely. So it's a, it's a very, it seems to me, the best method of all that we've seen so far under the criterion of the best being the most visually obvious similar within these fields of the ones that we've looked at so far. So once again, the bottom line is Try different clustering methods. Model-based clustering is an attractive alternative. It's easy to use with that mclust package, which is not installed by default. You simply have to type install packages mclust, and uh, <coughs> it's, uh, that's, that's on the course wiki. The best clustering method, thus, really depends on what you want to achieve. But one thing that I wanted to speak about a little is that clustering in such circumstances may not even be the best approach to begin with. And this brings us to this whole idea of density estimation. Now, clustering is a partition method. Clustering forces the data set to be partitioned into different sets. So if we simulate a data set, consider the following piece of R code. We set the seed to a particular value. Um, we create a vector, which is an R array. Uh, it basically, uh, we create a matrix, X1, which is an array of 70 uniform distributed values in the range between 0 and 10. And that's put into 35 rows and two columns. And we create a second matrix, we call that X2, which is 30 normally distributed values between, um, centered on, on, actually, I need to update this, this is, uh, should be five, with a standard deviation of 4.7, uh, 15 rows and two columns. Now we calculate the ranges the X ranges for these values. Because what I'm doing here is I'm superimposing two different distributions in two dimensions. One is a uniform distribution, one is a normal distribution, and there might be outliers. I want everything on my plot, so I use the command range to make sure I know what the smallest and the largest value is. And I put that on the variable X range, and Y range, the same thing for here for the first column and here for the second column. So I can make sure that my plot actually covers all of these data points. And then I plot them independently in a plot. Um, this is a normal scatter plot of the first ones, and I color them black. And then I tell this par nu equals t. And then I do a second plot, and this par nu equals t causes that new plot not to be updated. But it's overlaid over the first plot. So this is how I get a second plot overlaid on the first 
And in order to do that in the same coordinate frame, of course, I have to specify my limits on the x and y axis as f. So I, I can't let r, what it normally does very well, automatically determine the ranges, because then they would not get essentially into the same coordinate system. So it's the same. This is now colored red. I will suppress this play of axis. The axis have already been uh, displayed here. I will suppress the display of labels. The labels have already been generated here. I just want pure points as they are, and the result looks like that. So this is my normal distribution, and this is my uniform distribution. This is the way my data came up. I just know, because I've been generating them in this synthetic data set from two different distributions, that I should be coloring one red and one, one um, black. But that's not a luxury I normally have when I look at data. It would be all black or all red, and I would need to figure out what's going on in that data. Is there anything of interest? Now, it's obvious if I start clustering this into, say, two or three clusters, you know, I would probably get a cluster partition along here, or one along here, and so on. So there's certainly going to be many possible ways to cluster this. But it's probably equally obvious that I will not be able to consistently cluster data from noise or describe my data very well because there's overlap between the noise and the uniform distribution my data is used. This is one synthetic example that illustrates a situation where it's probably not good to try to cluster because the notion of partitioning is not what the data is made up of. The data is not purely able to be partitioned into two things. Um, we have data that we'd like to recover and we'd like noise. Now, um, density estimation is an approach that might be much more su suitable in this. So what's density estimation? Essentially, density estimation takes a discrete set of data points and it tries to, f to generate a probability distribution that's the most likely distribution where the discrete data points might have come from. So if I take a normal deviate, um, like R norm 100 in, in R, where, where I get a set of points that are dis distributed according to a Gaussian bell curve, and I plot a histogram, that histogram is going to be jagged and have having corners that sort of look like a Gaussian curve, but that are not themselves the Gaussian curve. Density estimation is the problem. How do I reconstruct smooth curve back if I only have observed single um, individual data points. The example data here um, is uh, taken, I think, from uh, Peter Dalgard's book, Introductory Statistics with R. Um, Raphael has mentioned that book. It's also on the course wiki. I find this a really, really excellent introduction into working with R. It explains a lot of the code that you use, even things that, that look trivial about the code at first. So if you're serious about this, I think this would be one of the first books to look at. At U of T, I don't know about the other institutions, but at U of T, we have it online in the library. So if you go to the U of T library and you look for the title of the book, you can connect to it online and just read it on your computer everywhere you are. You don't even need to buy it. Okay, <clears throat> so this is data. Um, it's a bimodal distribution um, that's got something to do with geyser eruptions in Yellowstone National Park. And the question is, there's a distribution behind that, a probability distribution, but we only have sampled these probability data. So how can we start, how can we reconstruct that? Um, the way this is done is, um, to run a density estimation. And what the density estimation does is it takes a number of so-called kernel functions. So basically, just in, in the Gaussian case, bell curves. And it adds bell curves together until it can fit and reproduce um, the, the, the observed data well enough. Now there's a, there's a term in there which is called bandwidth, and that's the question of how broad these bell curves are going to be. 
they're very narrow and very pointed, every one of these bell curves is going to sit exactly on top of an observation, and they're not going to contribute to each other. If they're too broad, they are going to basically you know, smear over um, the two peaks that we have in the, in the histogram. So this is a little bit dependent, the resolution. I'll, I'll show you another example on that. On the so-called bandwidth of the, be of the bell curve, um, but R has uh, the bandwidth SJ tells it to use an automatic parameter to optimally adjust the bell curve. So that's essentially all you need is to say, well, we want the density estimate for these eruptions with this bandwidth parameter, and we can put that into a plot command. Um, <coughs> again, overlay it over the histogram in this case. Suppress the titles, suppress the labels, suppress the axes, and so on. Color red red, and define line width equals three to make a very distinct and thick line. And that's what that looks like. So the density estimation here has now given us this bimodal distribution, probability density function, um, that would give rise to these histograms that we actually observe in the data. Now, why is that useful for clustering? Is, is everybody approximately clear with what this density estimation does? Right? So you have discrete data, usually never enough of it, and they're discrete anyway. And you're trying to establish what's the underlying distribution that could have generated these discrete samples that we're observing. Sorry. And when, what, in the coding, where, where do you put the setting button that gives you more broader or? Bandwidth. Here, this bandwidth okay. parameter says uh, use one of the automatic algorithms can also set it specifically. Actually, it's interesting to play around with it and show how how the curves then get more rugged and sharper mm -hmm. or broader yeah. and, and more so smooth. So if you put SJ, try several and uses the best one? Yes, or? yes. There's an, there's an algorithm how to choose that optimally. So <clears throat> this, is a, this is a little bit of an example from my own work. Where I'm interested in structure states and proteins. We're interested to find recurring patterns in protein structures. And we're interested to take small patterns and then ask, do we have clusters, essentially, of similar patterns in the very large multidimensional structure spaces of, say, you know, all, amino, all amino acid fragments that have five amino acids and that are folded in some way. So this is one representation of structure spaces. If you've ever worked with structure biology, you know what they're on. Chandran plot is, it essentially um, finds backbone torsional angles along the backbone of a protein structure. And if you plot these angles here, you see they are dense regions, here, here, and here. This corresponds to an alpha helix, this corresponds to the beta strands, and they are also um, dense in poor regions here. And the problem that we're setting ourselves is to find out how many, or well, where are there interesting clusters in all of structure space that might tell us something about how proteins fold and why proteins fold. And the way we've been approaching this is similar to kernel density estimation. Um, it's a problem that's not very uh, amenable to um, pure clustering procedures because they're ill-defined. And there's a lot in that that's just noise and that influence our clusters. Um, so what we'd really like to get at is just the best representations of each of these what we call structural motifs. So this is the, this is the way we go about it. Assume that you know, we just have a one-dimensional structure space and discrete observations. So this is one particular structure, a piece of protein structure, this is another uh, little fragment from protein structure, and so on. Small discrete and then we use a Gaussian kernel to estimate the density in that structure space. So basically what we do is we associate a Gaussian kernel with each and every single one of these observations here. And then we sum over all the Gaussian function. And we get this density estimate as a potential probability density function that gave rise 
all oxidations. And now, in order to find the representatives of these clusters, of, of the, the structural motifs, we don't try to cut them apart and, and to, to pry them apart in different subsets, but we, we look for the local maxima in that, in that density space. Yes? Did you present this in the standard deviation? So, Come again? Did you present the standard deviation for each particular deviation? Right now, all of these are just the standard observations in these axes. But the standard deviation of the Gaussian kernels is basically the same thing as the bandwidth. And that's, in, I think, the next or the slide after that. I'll get to that in a moment. So there's, there's no good and reasonable way to choose the standard deviation, except in some way. Well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that when I have the slide for that. So. That's, that's exactly the issue. What's the best choice of this parameter, the, the standard deviation of the curve? If I use very broad curves, I basically smooth <laughs> over all the differences in my cluster space. Um, there's some intermediate value that's, that's probably reasonable. But if I use very narrow curves, then I can get sub minima that I might not even want to divide it. So this is, you, you can think of this like resolution, looking at something at a very coarse grained resolution or a very fine grained resolution. And depending on what resolution you look at, you will get different results. But that's OK, because that's the way our data is structured. If we look at it in a very fine grained way, we should want to see substructures and things falling apart again into small details. But if we look at the whole thing at once, we might only be interested in, in the very large uh, pictures. And if these are maximally broad, uh, the entire space will just have a single peak that you can find it, no other local mass. So basically tuning the bandwidth of these kernel functions for the, for the, for the density estimation gives you a way to, to look at your data in, in a more smooth or in a more fine-grained way. We, we then go along and, and, and we just look for maximum, local maximum. Of course, if we would be looking for a global maximum, um, we would just find a single point. But if we're looking for well-behaved local maxima in some neighborhood of the point, we can then pick out points that are representative. Again, this is not a clustering procedure. But we're looking for local maxima after our kernel density estimation. And then we can say, well, these, these local maxima have a certain neighborhood of all things that, that are within some distance um, within the cluster center. And once we have the neighborhood, we can superimpose the fragments. This is one of the examples. So this is ranked uh, 399 in our little database of motifs that we found. It's a piece that has seven amino acids in length. This is the backbone superposition here. And we were only using the backbone for calculating the coordinate distances. But what turns out is even though this was not a search criteria, there are very significantly non-random sequence propensities. This position here is always either phenylalanine or tyrosine. This position here has a high likelihood of being uh, aspartic acid or glutamic acid. This position here is almost always serine, and so on. So <clears throat> um, why did nature choose these particular side chains and these particular sequences? Well, it's because these specific folds and shapes with that particular sequence give low energy conformations. Low energy conformations have high probability. Since they have high probability, they give peaks when evolution has explored its possibilities in, in uh, structure space. And we can reproduce these peaks with the kernel density estimations and find such things where sequence and structure come up to something like you know, a representation of the protein folding code. So this is not result of a clustering method, but result of a very different approach, looking for local maxima after density estimation. And um, some, some of the problems that we look at are much more suited to that. Okay. <clears throat>
So let's go back to the little example that we started off. Um, what does kernel density estimation in this data set mean? So I, I said, you know, we can cluster it. The code is there. It's easy for you to try to, to see whether you can come up with, with meaningful clusters here. But if we run the kernel density estimation, we row bind the two x and y, uh, the, the two the, the black points and the red points uh, together into one uh, joint file because the density estimation has to run over all of them. And we run the density estimation, but we only run it on the x coordinates. Uh, it has to be the density estimation here is one dimensional, so we just project everything down on the x coordinate. We would get a similar result for the y coordinate. So we could do other things to do it in, in, in higher two or three dimensional spaces. Um, and plot this as a fat blue curve over the same plot, and then it looks like this. So this now shows us that you know, we're interested in this, but there's something interesting going on in our data. It's very high and noticeable peak in that data distribution. And it would be relatively easy then to say, these are the coordinates of that peak here, and just rank everything according to distance from these coordinates and start analyzing what it is. It won't completely separate signal from noise, red from black, because that's just not in the data. But it will give us a good starting point and start analyzing them and grouping them. Yeah, very much scratching the surface regarding clustering algorithms. Um, there are many, many others. Um, If there are many others, it probably means none of them are good for all situations. So it's a useful tool. Um, you can shoot yourself in the foot with it and, and come up with the impression that there's something in your data that really isn't there. Um, once again, use it with moderation. Use it for exploratory data analysis. If you have to derive quantitative results, make sure that you use different approaches to clustering and uh, see how robust your clusterings are and uh, see if you can get independent validation. That's, that's always the, the, the most useful thing. For instance, if you cluster according to expression profiles and then you can independently see you have an enrichment of gene ontology categories, that's a good validation that your clusters are actually meaningful and not just artifacts of your data. Okay.